The United Nations Security Council is meant to safeguard international peace and security. Why then are we seeing wars? Why are wars or conflicts not being prevented or stopped even after several months or years? Does that mean that the UNSC is unable to deliver in its current form? Why does the club of permanent members still look the same? How come there is no representation in the all-powerful permanent five of any country from either Africa or Latin America even today? Can developing countries not aspire to be in the permanent category? And what about India? Does it not deserve to be a permanent member of the UN Security Council? Hello and welcome to Connecting the Dots. I'm Unman Padacharya. Let's connect the dots of why there has been no change in UNSC's permanent membership to date. A quarter century has passed. The world and our future generations can no longer wait increase the Security Council's membership from 15 to 25 or 26 by adding six permanent and four or five non-permanent members. That's how the G4 wants the United Nations Security Council to look. G4 stands for India, Germany, Japan and Brazil. Why are Ambassador Cambodia's words significant? Because India has shared this formula on what the G4 wants in the public domain for the first time. Now let's break down this proposal further. Out of the six new permanent members, G4 would like two to be from Africa, two from Asia Pacific, one from Latin America or the Caribbean and one from Western European and other states. And out of the four or five new non-permanent members, G4 would like one or two to be from Africa one from Asia Pacific, one from Eastern Europe and one from Latin America or the Caribbean. The point to be noted here is that specific countries have not been named, only continents or regions have been spoken about. This means that the G4 is calling for representation of the developing world, not necessarily of itself. This is not a match that it is playing with other aspiring group of countries for permanent membership. If this is not being the voice of Global South, then what is? The G4 is not even insisting on veto power for new permanent members, not at this stage at least. So that wrangling over it now does not make reform a non-starter. So while the G4 is accommodating, what about the P5? Does it not want change in its constitution? Had it wanted, it would have happened in these 25 years since world leaders committed to comprehensive reforms at the Millennium Summit in 2000. Listen to this. The very people who are the problem are also the people whose concurrence you need to do that reform. So that's where the problem lies. So I mean, if you're going to ask five countries saying, uh, would you mind changing the rules so that you have less power? Guess what the answer is going to be? Isn't it convenient for the P5 that even though the UN of today has four times more members than when it was formed in 1945, there has been simply no change whatsoever or expansion of the P5 member states to date. Even though the Security Council was expanded once in 1965 to bring in more non-permanent members, but the P5 remains untouched. Is it geopolitically relevant today to have the US, the UK, Russia, France and China only as permanent members? These were the allied powers that had won the Second World War or gained geopolitical importance after it. So should the world remain stuck in 1945-46 and ignore the aspirations of everyone else? That antiquated system is clearly not delivering. The UNSC can neither prevent wars nor stop them. Here are just two of the many reasons that explain why it has become so ineffective. One, 
The United States decided to invade Iraq in 2003 without the authorization of the UNSC. And two, Russia vetoes any response to its conflict with Ukraine at the UNSC. After the US-led attack on Iraq in 2003, India's then Prime Minister, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, had this to say. Until the UN Security Council is reformed and restructured, its decisions cannot truly reflect the collective will of the community of nations. That sentiment has endured. Not just India, the whole developing world is unhappy with UNSC's composition. In a sense in the global south that their problems of food and fuel and fertilizer are being just uh, brushed aside. Uh, and frankly, at the U, if you if you go to a UN General Assembly uh, uh, and talk to countries, you know there are countries in Africa and Latin America and the small island states, uh, quite apart from Asia and India, who feel very very strongly that this is not their UN. Now let me tell you something interesting. India could have become a permanent member of the UNSC in the 1950s itself. Yes, you heard that right. But the then Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, who was also India's Foreign Minister, spurned those chances. India got two golden chances to become a permanent member of the UNSC then. The United States in 1950 wanted China out as a permanent member and India in. But Nehru declined the offer. When Nehru's sister and India's ambassador to the United States, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, wrote to him in August 1950 about America's keenness to have India as a permanent member of the UNSC, this was Nehru's response. It would be a clear affront to China and it would mean some kind of a break between us and China. I suppose the State Department would not like that, but we have no intention of following that course. Nehru clearly did not want to upset China by going down that road. He was happy to keep India out. This was the first missed opportunity for India. But India got another chance in 1955. This time, the Soviet Union wanted India as the sixth permanent member. But Nehru declined again. On a visit to the USSR in August 1955, Nehru penned a note. This is an excerpt from it. India is not anxious to enter the Security Council at this stage, even though as a great country she ought to be there. The first step to be taken is for China to take her rightful place and then the question of India might be considered separately. So Nehru wanted China's candidacy to take precedence over India's even though USSR's offer was to have India as the sixth permanent member and not to replace China. Nehru thought India was not ready and must wait. And how did China return the favor? By attacking India in 1962. India thus missed two precious opportunities, all thanks to the lack of far-sightedness of its then leadership. A permanent membership would have helped India handle Kashmir, the 1962 war with China, the 1971 Bangladesh Liberation War, an evidence-based terrorist listing which China continues to block every now and then on its own, without having to be at the mercy of world powers or hoping that its friends will bail it out. The damage was done twice over. And for decades now, India has been at pains to correct this historical injustice. While the US, the UK, Russia and France have publicly supported India's bid for permanent membership of the UNSC, China never has. China, in fact, opposes it. But India deserved to be a permanent member of the UNSC then and deserves to be there now. It is the world's largest democracy where one-sixth of humanity lives. It is the oldest civilization and the youngest nation at the same time. It is a major military power and a responsible nuclear power. It is the fastest growing major economy in the world. It is the fastest emerging regional power in geopolitics. It is the only large nation which maintains close ties with both the United States and Russia and hence can be crucial for the maintenance of world peace. 
It has mainstreamed the voice of Global South and multilateral fora. It has helped countries in need during crisis. It has emerged as a solution provider to meet global challenges. It is also one of the largest troop contributing countries for UN peacekeeping missions. So will reform of permanent membership of the UNSC always remain a distant dream for the developing world? Membership reform has not been easy or speedy. It won't be in the future too. But keeping up the pressure is the only way to bring in change and usher in reformed multilateralism. It seems to be a question of when and not if. But the sooner the change comes in the better or the UN itself could slide further into irrelevance or even be consigned to the dustbin of history just as its predecessor, the League of Nations was. Time for a breather on connecting the dots. Are we truly alone in the universe? Or are there aliens who keep playing hide and seek with us? We explore that next. We just don't bring you the news as it unfolds. We get to the heart of the matter. We don't just present facts. We demystify complex social, political and economic events. We break stories that shape the world's present and future because you deserve the truth. I am Tanvi Taneja from New Delhi. I'm Oli Barrett from London. I'm Nick Harper from Washington DC. Join us on DD India Global Monday to Friday at these times. Turning crisis into opportunity, transforming ideas into action, stories of real change, tales of sustainable solution. This series is going to tell stories of such change makers. Watch Change Makers on DD India. the night sky and wondered if we are truly alone in the universe. Are you fascinated by the possibility of extraterrestrial life? Do you wonder if aliens have ever visited our planet? Throughout history, mysterious sightings of unidentified flying objects in short UFOs have captured the imagination of people across the world. And of course, Hollywood fueled the fire with epic movies. We have seen terrifying aliens in Steven Spielberg's movie, War of the Worlds, starring Tom Cruise. But the aliens were not always that frightening. You may have seen them partying in the Will Smith starer, Men in Black. Even E.T. found a friend on Earth and Bollywood's Koi Mil Gaya brought us the lovable Jadu. But when it comes to real UFO sightings, the United States takes center stage. A long history of strange sightings has fueled speculation about government cover-ups and alien technology. Conspiracy theorists believe the US government is hiding evidence of aliens and even studying their technology with private companies. The American intelligence agency CIA is even rumored to be involved. But hold on, in March 2024, the Pentagon released a report that might burst some bubbles. Let's rewind a bit first. After World War II, UFO sightings exploded. The 1940s and 50s saw flying saucers become a cultural phenomenon. But how did the term flying saucers come into the scene? In June 1947, American businessman and pilot Kenneth Arnold claimed that he saw a group of nine high-speed objects while flying over the Cascade Mountains near Washington. Arnold said the objects were moving at a speed of several thousand kilometers per hour. They appeared like saucers skipping on water. 
a newspaper got it wrong and described them saucer shaped in their report and that's how flying saucers were born. Now this wasn't the first sighting but it was the first big one to make headlines. It opened the floodgates for more reports making everyone look to the skies. Just two weeks after the flying saucer craze, the infamous Roswell incident took place. Conspiracy theorists believe it's proof of a crashed alien spacecraft and a government cover-up. A rancher named Mac Brazel found strange debris on his land in Roswell in New Mexico. The story spread. Initially, the military claimed it was a crashed flying disc sending shockwaves around the world. But the next day, they backtracked, calling it a weather balloon. So what was the truth? The weird stuff Brazil found turned out to be a broken balloon from a secret project to listen for Soviet bombs. This project was called Project Mughal. It used high altitude balloons with microphones, kind of like a spy in the sky. The project was top secret. So even though it wasn't aliens, it fueled the UFO rumors for years together. This was the Cold War era. Tensions were high and UFO sightings started capturing global attention. It was October 27, 1954. 10,000 spectators were watching a football match in Italy's Florence. The stadium roared with fans cheering for the favorite clubs. But suddenly, the stadium went quiet. Everyone stopped watching the game and pointed at the sky. The players froze and even the ball stopped rolling. The match was halted. The cause? A group of high-speed cigar-shaped UFOs hovering silently above the stadium. This wasn't just one crazy sighting either. Over the next few days, towns all across Tuscany reported seeing the same strange objects. Mysteries over aliens and UFOs are countless. More recently, Mexico held its first ever congressional hearing on the subject of UFOs in September 2023. Journalist and UFO enthusiast Jamie Mawson presented two tiny mummified bodies at the Mexican Congress. Mawson claimed the remains were about 1,000 years old and extra celestial. It means not related to any species on Earth. The bodies were retrieved from Cusco in Peru. They carry elongated skulls and just three fingers on each hand. Two months later, experts confirmed the mummies were real and non-humans. But they did not tell about the origin of the bodies. So the mystery still remains. Now, strange metal structures have been popping up worldwide in recent years. Nobody knows what's up with these giant metal poles. Now, a puzzling 10 feet tall steel structure has mysteriously materialized on a remote hill in the UK. Could they be alien markers? Only time will tell. But in recent years, similar structures have popped up in both the United States and the UK, leaving everyone guessing about their extraterrestrial links. Adding to this enigma, a metal slab mysteriously appeared and vanished in southeastern Turkey in February 2021. In November 2023, flight services at the northeastern Indian city of Imphal were disrupted over sightings of a UFO. The airport was shut for three hours. Soon after this, the Indian Air Force deployed fighter aircraft in search of the UFO. UFO sightings are on the rise in recent years. Could it be because everyone's armed with smartphones and fancy cameras today? Now, whenever someone sees something weird in the sky, they can simply capture it and share it with the world in seconds. Now get back to the United States. The US Air Force adopted the term UFO in 1953 and started a catalogue of sightings called Project Blue Book. Between 1952 and 1969, Project Blue Book compiled reports of more than 12,000 UFO sightings. Here, we must talk about Area 51, the US hotspot for UFOs. It is a super secret military base in Lincoln County in Nevada 
that has long been rumored to house alien technology. Hidden deep in the desert, the airfield is fenced off tight with warnings everywhere. Built by the CIA in the 1950s, Area 51 started as a hush-hush testing ground for a spy plane called the U-2. Since then, it's been at the heart of all sorts of classified military projects. Remember the Roswell incident in 1947? The one with the supposed crashed alien spacecraft and government cover-up rumors? Well, pop culture linked this whole thing to Area 51. With some even believing wreckage from the alien crowd was stashed there for study. Whispers say Area 51 is a haven for black projects. Those super secret military things the public is not supposed to know about. No wonder UFO hunters and thrill seekers flock to the nearby town of Rachel in Nevada hoping to catch a glimpse of the base or maybe even an alien spaceship. In September 2023, the Pentagon unveiled a new website where the public can access declassified information about reported UFO sightings. Later, the Pentagon's all-domain anomaly resolution office released a map showcasing hotspots for UFO sightings around the world. The map included the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki known for US nuclear strikes in 1945. The east and west coasts of the United States including California as well as parts of West Asia including Iraq and Syria are all hotspots for UFO sightings. In July 2023, former US intelligence official David Grush blew the whistle. He said, the US government has a secret UFO program that has been around for years. Grush has led analysis of unexplained anomalous phenomena or UAP within a Defense Department agency until 2023. At a hearing in the US Congress, he claimed they not only found crashed UFOs but also non-human beings. Now let's get back to March 2024 Pentagon Review report. The report says, after thoroughly examining all official US investigative efforts, since 1945, the Defense Department came to a conclusion that there is no proof of extraterrestrial intelligence visiting Earth or the government hiding crashed UFOs from the public. To date, Arrow has found no verifiable evidence for claims that the U.S. government or private companies have access to or have been reverse engineering extraterrestrial technology. Arrow has found no evidence that any U.S. government investigation academic sponsored research or official review panel has confirmed that any sighting of a UAP represented extraterrestrial technology. The report goes on to say that popular culture, including movies, books and social media, has fueled misunderstandings about alien visits. Even though they found no aliens, the report did say the government once thought about making a program to reverse engineer alien technology if it ever existed. So the possibility of alien life remains a thrilling mystery. And who knows what the future might hold? The Pentagon's report might not be the alien disclosure some were hoping for, but it is a sign that the search for answers is ongoing. Well, that's all in this edition of Connecting the Dots. We'll see you next week with more raging issues that touch our lives and imagination. Goodbye for now from all of us in the Delhi newsroom. Take care and stay safe.